So, hey, guys, listen, we're all trying to get more productive. And the question is, how do you find a way to get an edge? I'm a big believer that if you're getting mentoring or you're in an environment that causes growth, a growth-based environment, that you're much more likely to grow and you're going to grow faster. And that's why I love Growth Day. Growth Day is an app that my friend Brendan Burchard has created that I'm a big fan of. Write this down, growthday.com forward slash ed. So if you want to be more productive, by the way, he's asked me, I post videos in there every single Monday that get your day off to the right start. He's got about $5,000, $10,000 worth of courses that are in there that come with the app. Also, some of the top influencers in the world are all posting content in there on a regular basis, like having the Avengers of personal development and business in one app. And I'm honored that he asked me to be a part of it as well and contribute on a weekly basis, and I do. So go over there and get signed up. You're going to get a free, tuition-free voucher to go to an event with Brendan and myself and a bunch of other influencers as well. So you get a free event out of it also. So go to growthday.com forward slash ed. That's growthday.com forward slash ed. He goes, there's a batting cage that just opened up in the, in the town next to us. Mm. He goes, I'll make you a deal. I'll buy you as many tokens as you want as long as you hit every day. As soon as you stop hitting, the deal's off. Because I heard you're not even a good golfer. Well, I don't know where you heard that, but... I'm go, all go, over. I don't <laughs> Everybody has played with you. You're ill-informed, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> it's fine. I want to become a fitness model. I want to become a bodybuilder. I want to become a keynote speaker, and I want to break into the mainstream modeling industry. I don't know how I'm going to do them. You either support me or not, but this is what this is what I want to do. The things you are most ashamed of and embarrassed by that you think are the most insignificant are probably the very things that will qualify you to change their life. I want to go back to the kind of the beginning with you. Yeah. So Michael Jordan's got this amazing story that everyone throws around that, you know, yeah. he ends up being the greatest of all time, but he didn't even, you know, make his varsity team his sophomore year. There's right. this great story. And it's a great story. But the guy went to North Carolina, right. had a bunch of scholarship <laughs> offers. You, on the other hand, when I say this guy could hit, I mean, I, I other big league baseball players mm. envied your swing mm. and just were, you know, you just a remarkable hitter and player. But in high school, yeah. we go back, like, you didn't really have any juice. No one wanted you. Crazy. Out of high school, you couldn't even get a scholarship. <laughs> you couldn't even get someone to look at you. I want you all to think about this that are listening. Wherever you are in your life right now, you're like, no one knows me. Nothing's happening. This dude couldn't even get someone to come scout yeah. him. Never mind him offer you money. No one even come look, right? Is that no, true? No. I mean, you know, it's funny. We were talking about, you know, you're, you're out in Cal California. Yeah. You got, you got, hey, we had nine dudes from our high school get drafted. I'm like, what? Well, I, right. I, could, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen nine scouts in my life in <laughs> Pittsburgh. Incredible. You know what I mean? It was incredible. Yeah. So. You know, it's it's a great story, and I you know as I look back, and I I think we were we were talking earlier, like my dad's in a place right now where yeah. he's go, has gone through two open heart surgeries and and all this stuff. So it, you know, even more like he and I have connected, and mm. and we we've kind of gone back down memory lane. And mm. you know, it's funny when I look back at when I look back at you know growing up in Pittsburgh, like you know I was one of the better players, probably 10, 11, 12, you know how that goes. Then you yeah. go to the bigger fields, thirteen, fourteen, mm -hmm. and so I remember being fourteen years old, and um, and and I. I wasn't. I didn't play at all freshman year, and I'm like, man, why am I not playing Wait, at all? You didn't play. Like I played a little bit. I was like, hey, Casey, get in there and pinch hit, and I'm like, what? You yeah. know. So yeah. So didn't really play much. Played a little bit here and there, and I remember like a few games into the year going to my dad and being like, hey, dad, mm. help me out here. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you know how good I am. I, yeah. You saw me hitting bombs when I was 12, just crushing right. balls like right. 220 in a right. gap. You know what I right. mean? Like right. dominating. You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm like, you know, and I. You know that I should be starting as a freshman, you know, mm -hmm. freshman baseball. And he's like, and I was like, do you think you could go talk to the coach? Mm -hmm. would, you know, that'd be, that'd be just help me out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We go get your dad to kind of snow plow in yeah. there. And a lot, hey, a lot of guys do do that. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I think back now as a dad, and I know you do too, Ed, is the conversation you have with your kid. Like, mm -hmm. man, am I enabling my kids? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like you disable people when you enable them. You know, yeah. am I enabling my kids sometimes? Am I making it too easy? Mm -hmm. And and do I say no enough to maybe sometimes the, for, yeah. for a lesson, right? And like, so when I look back at this conversation, had my dad gone and talked to the coach, we're not even talking. Yeah, isn't that incredible? We're not even talking. So he says no. So my dad says no. He's like, you know what, Sean? I'm not going to talk to the coach. Mm. He goes, he goes, but. He goes, one thing I will say is the kid that's playing ahead of you, I don't think he's better than you, but you're not glaringly better than him. Wow. You're not glaringly better than him. He goes, if you want to start playing, then you got to start taking accountability for who you are as a player and for you, who you are as, you know, putting in the work. Wow. He goes, there's a batting cage that just opened up in the, in the town next to us. Mm. He goes, I'll make you a deal. He goes, I'll buy you as many tokens as you want, mm. as long as you hit every day. Wow. As soon as you stop hitting... The deal's off. I love your dad. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, and I yeah. said, you know what? 
you got to deal, Dad. Mm. He goes, you got to start being accountable for who you are and putting in the work. And Ed, I, I, dude, I, I started falling in love. I, I went I went to the cages. I went to this batting cage. It was Grand Slam USA. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Remember Grand Slam yes. when they first came out? Yes. And I look back like things you're grateful for. I literally, my gratitude journal recently was like, I'm so grateful that that guy, Dick Thomas, decided to put a Grand Slam USA yeah. in the town next to me in Pittsburgh. Wow. You know, it's incredible when you yeah. think yeah. back of your life. You know yeah. what I mean? So I end up meeting a guy on Tuesday nights named Frank Porco. Never played, never played, um, never ever played college baseball, but he was a hitting instructor. I know? wanted to ask you that. So this yeah. guy that helped you Bro. didn't even play college baseball? Didn't play college baseball, just mm. a high school. And he was making some money on the side. But Ed, mm. talk about divine intervention. Yeah. This guy knew hitting. Mm. This guy knew hitting. And all the years I played in the big leagues and all the, all the you know, hitting coaches I've been around, I still feel like. Frank Porco really? in Bethel Park, you know, uh, Pennsylvania was the best coach. Wow. And so I would go to him every Tuesday night. My dad didn't make a lot of money. He was a chemical salesman mm. making like 33 grand a year, you know. So I knew those tokens were a big deal. Yeah. I didn't take that for granted. I knew those tokens. I knew the deal was a big deal, right? Mm. So um, I would go every Tuesday night, hit mm. with Frank Porco for 30 minutes, 5, 30, 6 o'clock, 20 bucks. You know, it's a lot more now. Yeah, <laughs> it's not right. 20 bucks, yeah, right. but 20 bucks. And then I would just stay, man. And I became obsessed with the, the, the mechanics of, of a swing, all because I wanted to play JV baseball. That's it was, crazy. It was all because I wanted to start my sophomore year, really. Right? And it's just, when I look back and like, you know how you talk about just like the compound pounding, the marginal gains, yes. like I could see myself getting like a little bit better every time. Like, oh mm -hmm. man, my front shoulder's staying a little better. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really driving off my backside. So next year it comes along and... My dad was right. He's like, man, it, this is going to work. So sophomore year, I start JV, right? And I'm like, wow, this is working. My dad's right. Like, mm -hmm. it's that, you know, and, and he was always telling me, you want to, and I was like, well, I'm going college baseball one day. And I was like, all right, preparation, meeting opportunity. Like, mm -hmm. be ashamed one day, Sean, if you came, if, if the opportunity came along and you weren't prepared. I'm like, mm -hmm. and I kind of took that stuff to heart. It was just yeah. such great lessons. So my sophomore year, hitting every day still. I, I didn't play any other sports. I did play uh, some football and basketball, but by my sophomore year, I was just playing baseball. But I hit every day, hit every day after school. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm junior year, I'm starting varsity. And then senior year, I'm starting varsity. Now I'm a good hitter though, Ed. Yeah, now you now can I'm break. Like, now this you can works. Break. Yeah, yeah. This uh, doing stuff every day, like, you know, th that invisible, those invisible games, he really do work. And yeah. I was driving balls all over the park. Mm -hmm. So we get to my senior year man and and you know uh kind of another just a great lesson from my dad um he had just started a, a new company called casey chemical he's been waiting to do it he's 50 years old now he's like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna start it it was a you know it, it was he was like a middleman for like you know for selling surfactant chemicals right okay and and so i could i saw how how much he grinded i saw mm. like the, the work ethic that he put in and i could see now what he was talking about mm. four three years earlier so and we every every month I'd come home from school and and uh, he would be here. Hey, time to send out the uh, network marketing. Yeah. He's like, we got five thousand letters, Shawnee. Get those, get that those lips ready because you're going to be licking those envelopes and sending them off. And we would send them out. He would say, Hey, listen, if we get three or four people to to, to, to come back, we got a sale. Yeah. We're going to pay the bills. And that's that was like wow. the kind of the thought process, right? Wow. So during my senior year, I had no college scholarship offers, not division one, division two, II, division three, right? Just like mm. they weren't there. And you know, you know, remember back in high school, you'd go to those tryouts where like, yes. you know, the big league teams would come and then you'd yep. run the 60 and that's why yep. you got, and you're getting drafted. Yep. He was like, this, my leg could fly. You right. know what I mean? They're right. like, this Casey, like, does he have a, does he have a, a, a disease we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> Guy looks like he's ice skating quicksand. You know what I mean? They're like, so, so I'd run the 60, seven, four, seven, five. I'd come, I'd come back, Eddie, after the trial. I'm like, oh, yeah, when are we going to hit? And they're like, all right, these guys are coming back for day two. Yeah. And they'd go down the list. They'd be like, and I'm like, uh, Casey, uh, I think you left off. Sean Casey's like, no, you're not on the list. Seven, four, five, we'll see you next time. Go to the uh, Royals tryout next week. Oh, I'm like, my gosh. so, dude, it was like so frustrating because I'm like, is this a track tryout or are we going to hit? Right, We're not exactly. going to hit like this, this right? Baseball. So, 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 my dad, at that point, I was getting not many looks. And my dad said, you know what, Sean? Mm. I sat down with the mic and said, Dad, I really want to play college baseball, but no one's coming. Mm. And he goes, no one is going to come. Mm. He goes, no one's coming, Sean. Mm. He says, you want, to make, you, you want to go play college baseball? You got to start playing offense, not defense, so and quit waiting for somebody to come. Oof. He's like, how about tomorrow? Mm. You come home from school, you come up to my office, Casey mm. Chemical. Mm. You sit down with me. Mm. We're going to write 30 letters. Mm. You're going to write the... 30 schools that you want to go to wow. division two II, division three wherever you want so i come home from school that day i'm kind of fired up yeah i got a guy got a game plan i sit mm -hmm. down with my daddy goes here we go 
Mm. So bam, I write the first one to Penn State, next one to Clemson. Then I'm writing to College of Wooster, Mary. I'm writing whoever, yeah. whoever will listen. Yeah. I just opened my mind. I'm like, I'm going to play in the big leagues one day, but I got to get to a college first. Why did your face change when you started to talk about your dad writing the letter? I'm just curious. Like, your face changed a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You know what? Because it fires me up. I'm yeah. so grateful. Yeah. I'm so grateful. Mm. You know, it just, you, you, you know, I'm 48 now. It's, <clears throat> so you're grateful for those. You're grateful when you look back when you're 18 years old, yeah. 17, 17 years old, and, and uh, you know, you've got a dad that's, that's willing to stand next to you when you're, yeah. when you're grinding. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then when yeah. it's, you know, when it's, you know, when it's not, it, you know, it, when everyone tells you you're too slow, you're this and that, mm. you know, you've got the guy next to you say, you can do it. Yeah. Why not you? Yeah. You know, and I told you the truth too, right? Like, Hey, no one's coming. Hey bro. No, no one's, one's coming. coming. And you know, what? and I think that's the reality of it. Yeah. That was the reality of it. Like, and then I get, you know, I was like, when you, you know, fight with reality, only you lose a hundred percent. I'm like, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. So we sit down and write these 30s, 30 amazing. I just got to tell you, like yeah. you're getting me, like, I don't know yeah. why my eyes are watering, <laughs> yeah. but like, I know that that was a, def- like, you're not here. If you don't write those letters, you're not, I know they're going to hear it in a minute, but like, you're not here. If your dad doesn't stand by you, you're not here. If yeah. you don't play offense, he doesn't tell you no one's coming, Shawnee. No one's, no one's coming. coming. No one's coming. It's just, it's just amazing yeah. how l- moments in life can define us, right? That's like, what I mean. Like, even yeah. when my kids, I'm like, God, I hope I'm saying the right Me stuff. Too. Dude, Me don't too. you feel that yes. way? Like, yes. I hope I'm giving the right lessons. Right. I hope I'm not just snow plowing, you Me. know, the road for them and making yeah. sure everything's smooth. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the, 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 the adversity that I had was the, what, that's where I got my advantages, right? From, so, so you write the letters. So I write the letters, dude. Write 30 letters. Right before I'm done, I, I get up to go. He goes, hey, 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 sit back down. He goes, Got one more letter. He goes, University of Richmond sent you a flyer. I'm like, a flyer. <laughs> yeah, you know, now flyer. it's like social media. These kids yes. are like, hey, look at my swing. Check me out. Look, yeah. like I got millions of followers. Yeah. They're like, hey, University of Richmond sent you a flyer last year from the Keystone State Games. Why don't you send them one too? Wow. So, bam, last letter, University of Richmond. Dear University of Richmond, thanks for the flyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I really think I can play there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. So, bam, season goes on, dude. And I'm yeah. still hitting every day after school. And I'm having a great year. We end up winning the championship that year at, at, at my – uh, my school up in St. Clair, mm. but with four games to go, brother, mm. and it's incredible how this how this works. First at bat, I remember we're playing this team called Montour. I get a pitch middle away, bam, rocket left center. You know, yeah. I'm like, let's go, a couple ribbies. You know, yeah. Yeah. next next pitch, you know, get a pitch middle and bam, right right center. You know, yeah. so I'm four for four, eight RBIs. You know, and and yeah. and four doubles. And you know, bro, like yeah. you you could probably look back at your high school career, yeah. college career, and mm-hmm. you know the games. Yeah. There's a handful of them where you're like, Absolutely. Hey, that was yeah. that's incredible. Yep, yep. Well, that was my greatest high school game ever. Yeah. Hands down, no doubt about it, no, 100%. But, so Jerry Malarkey, who's the who's the coach at Upper St. Clair, I'm, I'm running out to play first for the seventh inning. We're mm. dominating his team. He's like, hey, Case. He's like, man, you've had a heck of a game. Mm. He goes, uh, how many hits you got? I got four hits, man. He goes, how many ribbies you got? I got eight ribbies, Jerry. He goes, yeah, you know what? That's great. Mm. He goes, you see the guy behind the backstop right there? Mm. That's Mark McQueen. Just drove six hours from the University of Richmond uh, to come see you play. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, he wants to talk to you after the game. Oh, my god! <laughs> so after the game, I went over. Preparation meeting opportunity. Right preparation there. meeting opportunity. And I yeah. remember thinking to my dad, like, dad, what's this preparation meeting opportunity stuff? Is, yeah. Are you BSing here? Because yeah. I don't see any opportunities, yeah, right? right? But he's like, what, he, and he, always, he was always adamant once, one's going to come. Mm. one's going to show up, you know? And I went over to Mark McQueen, shook his hand. He said, hey, man, he's like, really like your swing. Uh, you know, he goes, I, I, let me get back to you tomorrow. So he went back to Coach Atkins back in R- Richmond, called me, offered me a $1,000 scholarship. And I think at the time, Richmond was like thirty grand. My dad made thirty three grand. I was like, oh dad, what are we going to do? He's like, we'll figure it out. We'll take that. a second mortgage on the house. We'll get some financial aid. So I went to University of Richmond, brother, on the only offer that I had from those letters that I sent out because tr- playing offense and not defense, right? Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah, incredible. <clears throat> I go to University of Richmond. Are you, wait, are you all hearing this? <laughs> Just so you know, the end of the story is this man plays 12 years in the major leagues as one of the greatest hitters over a decade in the major leagues. Multiple all-star teams. This dude got no looks. No, look, you're, if you feel like you're missing your, like, are you hearing this? He gets a thousand dollar, and all due respect to University of Richmond, right. all due respect. But this is not like Arizona State well, either, it's, right? It's a mid-major, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like, like big time. It's incredible. Go yeah. ahead. It's Inc- incredible. Incredible. So I go to University of Richmond, <clears throat> hadn't even seen the school. Show up first day with my buddy Jay Adams. Hey, man. Hey, nice campus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're taking 45 visits. Yeah. You're like, hey, Ed Milet, yeah. let's yeah. get him. To be, this guy's going to be leading off for us for three years. We've got Boom, 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 Pac-10, SEC. I'm like, hey, great campus. Yeah, and you know? I'm interviewing you. 
you know. Just so you know. And you're the one who played 12 years in the big league. So it all works out okay. You're on my show talking about your big league career. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible. It's it's incredible how life works out. So true. So I go to University of Richmond, bro. I end up starting my freshman year. I have a good good freshman year. Freshman All-American. Like, you know, I mean, in that league. But I'm still developing as a player. My sophomore year, I do well, and I go to Cape Cod League. Mm -hmm. And you obviously know Mm -hmm. that's your ticket. If you can get to the Cape, you know, in that year, Todd Helton was there. Darren Nurse, that was there. Mike Lowell, some good players, right? Have a really good summer. Hit like 340 with the wood bat. You know, Mm -hmm. almost, you know, lead league in RBIs. And the only reason I say that is because it's the part of the story. I go back my junior year. And I be and I and I and I hit 461, and I led NC Division One, NCA baseball, in hit in batting. Incredible. 461, incredible. incredible. So I think back to three years earlier, or six years, seven years earlier. I'm asking my dad to go talk to the freshman high school coach Gosh. because I'm not playing, and he just gives me the lesson of you got to work harder, you got to put the time in, you got to start being accountable for what you do, set new routines. What are your habits after school? Mm. All that stuff, and that, and then for me, it, then all started to develop. Like I look back and like. Seven years later, gosh, with the with with like you talk about yeah. the co- the compound pounding, that yep. pinata effect of the invisible yep. games, all that stuff. Yep. Seven years later, in the NCAA Division of Champions, that is freaking incredible. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something called becoming an impossibility thinker and yes. a possibility achiever. Yep. And so many people that I see are self sabotaging because they're not viewing it through that lens. So yep. talk yep. to us a little bit about that. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm typing this great note down. Um, here's the thing. Here's the governor that you put on yourself if you're someone who is not an an impossibility thinker. Being an impossibility thinker is really simple. It's being willing to envision things you're ill prepared to do. Yeah. See, the 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 people that I know that I think have achieved this level of success, they have a lower threshold for what they need to know about something in order to imagine it and believe it's possible. So unsuccessful people have a very high threshold of what they have to know. (laughs) <laughs> or what they have to have everything in place. And so they won't step into the unknown. I used to coach a race car driver. I won't say his name because I had an NDA with it, but a very successful NASCAR driver. And he told me, he goes, Ed, the most difficult thing in racing is not the normal race. It's when there's a crash in front of you. And when there's this crash in front of you, because I want you to imagine you're going 180 to 200 miles an hour. And all there is, is a cloud of smoke. That's all you see. And you have to drive into that cloud of smoke not knowing that on the other side, there may be a stalled car, but you're going to hit head on and kill yourself. And he said, it's your ability to drive through that fog, drive through that unknown, drive through that smoke that separates you from other drivers. What most guys do is they start looking at the wall and they veer towards it. And he said, my ability to drive through that crash smoke, even though I don't know what's on the other side of it is what separates me from other guys. Mm-hmm. And man, that's so true in business and life too. successful yes. people are willing to drive through the smoke, not knowing what's on the other side, but believing I'll be resilient enough when I get in the room to figure it out. Yeah. Unsuccessful people or people who are not successful yet go, I'll go, I'll drive once I know. I'll go once this, once the conditions, once my kids are growing, once I have this much, once I read one more book, once I do one more, once, one, once I get, and the, the, the threshold keeps getting higher and higher and higher and they never take action. That's a big separator. In order to achieve the impossible, you have to be willing to imagine it and actually allow your brain to go there knowing you don't have all the information. I have a podcast. This is probably the most successful business podcast, you know, weekly podcast on the planet, entrepreneurship. Man, I started out, I didn't even know how to order the microphone. The first one I did, I didn't record it. <laughs> I forgot to record it, right? Like my son was the editor. He was 16, but I was willing to get into the space not knowing everything. I didn't know who the guest was going to be. Man, I didn't even know how you posted it once you recorded it. <laughs> I remember, I remember uh, Tony Robbins was like, hey, man, you, you put that thing on the chip. I'm like, chip? He goes, in the recording device, dude, you have to have a microchip in there to record the show. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought you just pressed record. He goes, what did you think you were recording it on? I'm like, the machine. Oh, my gosh. There's a ch- so what if I would have thought about all I didn't know? I wouldn't have the number one show in the world. Yeah. So. You got to start to drive through the smoke. Yeah, no, gosh, that's so good. You know, I was just thinking too, um, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is this, that goals are energy. I've never heard somebody actually phrase it that way. Yeah. You know, there's lots of things on goal setting, make smart goals, let's do this. But then you said goals are energy. And I got to thinking about it. I'm like, anything that I, that I intentionally went after with my, with my full heart, with my full self, mm-hmm. always manifested in some way, shape or form, may not look like exactly like I thought it was going to look, or when you thought it would happen either. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Talk to me about goals and energy because I, I had never heard someone actually say it that way before. Well, goal is a thought and a thought creates a space that didn't exist before you have it. And I'm not going to get really quantum on you, but it actually creates an energy field that didn't exist before you had it. So when you have a goal, it creates an energy around it. That goal now has a vibrational frequency and the more you feed it and the more it vibrates faster and you start to feed it and feed it and feed it, its energy level can get up to a point where it achieves itself. Yeah. And most people don't look at it that way, but that's exactly how it is. I'm a Christian. You are as well. But mm -hmm. I also believe there's an energy field that just the almighty created. Yep. And so I believe goals have energy to them. Now, having said that, I don't think you get all your goals. And yeah. I say it in the book, I think you always get your standards, though. And that's yeah. why the next chapter is on standards. Goals without standards are empty. What yeah. I really focus on is what my standards are that can help deliver on the goals that I have. So the goal creates the energy. The standard creates the delivery mechanism. Jeez. Mm. Can I be transparent with you about something? Please. So as a Christian, I've been on the fence for probably 24 months, right? Because I'm meaning not, not with my faith, but with elements of how quantum and energy and stuff relate to my faith. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered Dispenza's work, you know, a couple of years ago, probably when everybody else really started to, and I started yeah. to kind of go through some of his work and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until you, at Max Out Live, where you actually mm -hmm. stood up in front of everybody and said, look, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in energy. And I believe this resonance and this vibration is real mm -hmm. that I actually felt OK. Yeah, because I've I been carrying you. that with me for so long. Not sure because, you know, I, I go to a you go to a traditional pastor kind of scenario and not everybody kind of gets it. Yep. And then you can if you go new, you go too far new age and then it, then you kind of start losing a little bit of your faith. I've been then walking you, this then, yeah, the new, forever. Yeah, dude. Me too, brother. The new age is like your God. And I don't buy that at all. Yeah, yeah, I know me really well. By the way, I'm really, no one's ever said that to me before, ever. And I have too. In fact, the chapter I wrote on faith and energy took longer than the rest of the book combined. Mm -hmm. And um, I really struggle with it because I wanted to honor my faith at the same time, be honest about it. Listen, this, this interview is going well. Why? There's an energy frequency happening here. Yeah. You always know when you're in a space. God gave you this energy. God gave you discernment. Discernment is energy. Talks about it in the Bible. Doesn't call it energy, calls it discernment. But what discernment is, is you're sensing energy. Discernment tells you this person, I don't, you ever meet somebody, you're like, nah, I don't oh, feel yeah. it. Absolutely. Right? What's that come from? That's discernment, which is energy. So you're already proving that there's an energy field or you've been other people like, man, I can't explain it, man. I yeah. like this dude. I like her. Right. There's an energy frequency. So to deny that is ridiculous. Also, highest energy wins. People that make us feel good. Yeah. What is a feeling? It's an energy. Right. It's an energy. So everything is energy. We're always feeling energy. Highest energy wins. I'm trying to transfer energy when I speak. So to deny its existence is insane. In fact, take churches. A really ch a good church is on fire for the body of Christ has an energy that's infectious mm -hmm. and people are excited. Like, why do you want to bring why do you want to bring people to church? Because the magnetic. energy, yeah. the yeah. feeling, right? We do something special here. So actually, I think great pastors understand energy. And I will say this to you. It's I struggle with it as well because I I um as a as a devout man of God of as a Christian, I always worry I'm sounding new agey. Me too. Right. When I'm like, oh, you can tap into this field. And so I always am. I always am reluctant. But I've I've come to the conclusion that all of the beautiful things in life that have served me have come from the almighty, have come from God. Yep. And I know energy exists. Yeah. It's, I think and I think success has an energy. I think failure has an energy. I think slumps have an energy. We yeah. all know this. As I say it, you're all nodding. So to deny its existence is crazy. Having said all of that, I believe that energy is spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I when I speak, you go, man, when you speak, sometimes I'm like, hey, man, that's not always me. That's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how to put it all together quite yet, but I'm not so sure that the Holy Spirit doesn't have something to do with energy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I, I think we'll, we'll, you know, guys like you and I that talk openly about this stuff, maybe we'll find better ways to phrase it. Yeah. But we certainly feel it. We certainly know it. I don't believe the fact that you buy into energy discounts the fact that you have a Lord and Savior. Yeah. And I think the notion of it's crazy. Does that mean you're not going to get criticism for people to think any word like that's blasphemous? Yeah, but I've just decided that's OK. I'm not religious. I have a relationship with God. It's a my relationship with Jesus. Right. Yep. And sometimes it's roaring and doing great. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, why are you doing this? Yeah. Why are you? Like, My dad died. What's going on here? I, I was at Chalk Hospital this week with kids that are, you know, one of the little boys has leukemia. Do you you don't think for a minute, I went, Lord, come on, man. 
Yeah. Let's get this, you know, but I understand there's a higher purpose. I understand there's a calling. I understand there's an energy to it. So, man, I'm really appreciate you're transparent about that. It's, it's, it's probably the most difficult thing I've struggled with in my life too. Getting in the environment, changing my environment yeah, yeah. to be around people that were further ahead in some of the games of life I wanted to be in has had a huge impact on me. So a couple of these homes have paid for them damn selves just by, just by the people I got around. Okay, so so now let, let, let's just leap off into that, all right? Okay. Okay, because you got to leave the middle class to get to the upper class. That's right. I mean, if you want to get to the top, you got to leave the middle. You agree with that? You got to abandon almost everything you learned there. So so. Your, your move to Idaho, that, that, buying that house. Explain to everybody where it is and who lives there. Oh, oh really? And why, why exchanging money mm-hmm. for that access is, okay. is valuable okay. in part. All right, so. This is, this is real power you're talking about. So here. the first thing I did is I, I moved there literally because of who some of the members of a couple of the clubs were. And some uh-huh. of this is not stuff that you can go into. But so I didn't, the home I'm in now wasn't my first home. I bought a home I could actually You'll afford. draw names in a second, I guarantee you. Stop it. will be a second I'll be sweeping up He's after. He's begging for them. Is he not fishing for these Give me one names? name, give me one name up there. And Coeur d'Alene, I can't even say it right, Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene. Well, when you can Coeur d'Alene. afford, you tell can me you'll pronounce it right. I'll help you get up there. Tell um, me. Uh, tell me, tell me one name of one famous person who lives up in the Carleones, with the Carleones. Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene. Uh, uh, um, uh, Tony Robbins. Okay, give me another one. Uh, no, we're not going to do this. No, uh, give me one more. Give me one. John more. Elway. Okay, give me one more. No, I'm not just doing one more. No. The third one. Because you're the third. You're, you're Adam Levine. See, I tell you, okay. I'm sweeping up after. I told you it'd be a second before you're, you start you're, dropping you're, names. You're, and, uh, and someday, Grant Cardone is okay. what I hope. But anyway, what happened was I got up there, and one of the reasons I sought those, it was beautiful. I, I bought a place I could relatively afford. It was a stretch, but not crazy. And I got around. It wasn't the sports guys. It wasn't the entertainers. It was the business people. It, it's on the lake. Yeah, yeah but it was get the, a fancy boat there's, there. there's two top 50 golf courses. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I got three boats, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but so there's, it's a top, there's two top 50 golf courses yeah, on this yeah, lake that I, yeah. one's called Gaza Ranch that I'm a member of, yeah. one's called um, the Club of Black Rock. They're wonderful golf courses, but more uh-huh. importantly, the membership is are people that were further along in the game of life than I was. Access. And getting and one thing about golf, as you've known, is you get four or five hours, you get to know somebody. It's not like a five minute lunch, where everyone's chewing their food. You play mm-hmm. golf with somebody four or five hours. I remember one of my mentors told me, Eddie, rich men play golf. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, I'm not rich yet. I, I don't want to golf. It's boring. It's slow. You can't hit anybody. It doesn't require weightlifting. You can be fat and win. It's not even really a sport. You know? Yeah. And then uh, he goes, you didn't hear what I said. Rich men play golf. Mm-hmm. And he goes, if you want to be around these people, you need to play some damn golf. Rich men play, play golf. golf. And by the way, there's some validity to that. There's some broke dudes that play golf, too. Yeah. Well, it depends on the golf course. It does depend on the golf course. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, there's some there's some posers everywhere. So, so let, let's say there's a guy or gal or family out there, and they're, they're let's say they're doing $58,000 a year. Yeah. They're just getting started, trying to put it all together. Maybe the husband and wife both make eighty grand a year. Yes. And, and they like golf. Okay. Okay. Should they be playing golf just to play golf, or should they be no. going to the country club where the players are, where yeah. the rich men play golf? Yeah, I think for access. Okay, let me tell you how I did yeah. it. So I don't think you should be playing much golf at all at that level. There's a way that you uh-huh. can play success golf, though. Mm-hmm. And so success the, golf. Yeah, and the, and the way that you do that, in my opinion, is first you got to go. You have to start a business. But nobody lives in any of these places or employees. Because I heard you're not even a good golfer. Well, I don't know where you heard that, but all, all over. I don't. <laughs> Everybody has played with you. <laughs> Maybe I told you that just because no, we're going to no, gamble. No, but because but, 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 yeah. so, you're not out there to play good golf. No, right? but you're ill-informed. But that's okay. I mean, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but I'm not a great golfer. I'm not. Good, thank you. But I'm better. I know I can beat you because I've seen some. I swings. can't wait to find out. But yeah, me too. Um, but anyhow, well, here's what I did to get into golf. I, what I did is first you have We're to. We're gonna become, video that whole thing. Yeah. Wow. There's like thirty four dollars there. That's awesome, man. Um, thank you, rich man. Anyway, uh, there's like two hundred. Rich men play golf. <laughs> you can't, I can't when you can hold your money like oh this. You need to get a bigger stack. Go you get hold my a whole bunch of stuff like this. You? <laughs> That's your normal grip, isn't it? Right yeah. there. Um, anyway. Uh, here's what I did for golf. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you got to find a business you're going to start. And here's what I did. I played a game with myself. And that game was this. If I hit my certain goals in a given month, I think you should go touch your dreams. Uh-huh. I think you should live in your dreams. I think uh-huh. the, the more familiar you become with your dream or whatever it is you want, the more you can touch it, feel it, and be around it, yeah, yeah, the more yeah, likely yeah, you become yeah, comfortable yeah, yeah. in it, the more likely you'll acquire it. And so one of the big things that I did was I would set these goals up, whether it be an income goal or a production goal. This is when I was part-time as an entrepreneur. And I'd say, if we hit X, we're going to go away for one night. 
and that one night would be to a nice place. It might be like the Ritz Carlton Laguna Beach, right? Where I would go, or the La Quinta Resort in Palm Desert. And I'd do uh -huh. one night in my dream. I'd spend the three or four hundred bucks. My yeah, wife would yeah, get a nice yeah, massage. Get a taste of it. And, and I'd go play golf. And guess who you run into those golf courses? Yeah, yeah. You run yeah. into some rich dudes. Uh -huh. And I'd run into those guys on the golf course, and I would get to know them for that weekend, that time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't you're golf. Touching, you're touching possibility. You're living Potential. in your dream. The more you can yeah, touch yeah, it. Yeah. If, you, if your dream is to feed a million people, spend one day a month actually in mm -hmm. those charities mm -hmm. feeding people. The more you get comfortable mm -hmm. in your dream. So you don't wait until you, you're you're no, set to no. do it. You get little, you never do, you know this. Every yeah. little thing you've acquired, even even getting Elena, you talk about how you chased her for 13 months. You got you got around her a little bit in the meantime because the more comfortable she could get with hearing your voice messages are from you, the more likely she's gonna get in your dream. Yeah, you belong yeah, in your yeah. dream, but you have to touch it regularly before you get it. Mm -hmm. And so I would do that. And so so tell, give me an example of when you started touching stuff. Like, like before you were, how, when did you get married? How old were you? 25. 25, that's young. I was young, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Like, how'd you know that was, she was the one? Well, we started dating in high school. Yeah. And so I think just that was a long time to wait, really. Yeah, yeah. If you think yeah. about it. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a long time to wait to get married. Was, you were, you, did you have money then? I had no money then. Yeah. No, no. In fact, she paid for our wedding. And we got married at the Shiloh Inn in Pomona, and my wife paid for the entire wedding. And it's because she worked at that hotel in the banquet department. And my, my honeymoon that night was one night at the Shiloh in Pomona. That was the entire honeymoon we took. So uh -huh. no, there was, I had no money. I mean, literally no money. In fact, yeah. my car was repoed like about eight months after that wedding. Wow, after you had a car wedding. repoed? What I'd kind of car? I'd have caught a, a Acura NSX. No, Acura, not NSX, Acura Integra. Uh -huh. I had that repoed. They I took the, it away from you. They did. I had, the, I had the water turned off in my house at one time. We were showering down in the condo. So that's part of being an entrepreneur. I think a lot of entrepreneurs think, oh, this is a sign to stop, right? I've gone broke. I've, I've, uh, this isn't working for me. Most of us, most entrepreneur stories, if you really looked at it, they're nasty. Mm -hmm. They're ugly. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of down, embarrassing times. We just stayed. We got off the mat faster. We did not, it's not that he didn't go broke at some time or I didn't go broke at some time or there wasn't setbacks we just kept getting back up and that's the difference mm -hmm. yeah so so when you made the from baseball player to yeah. to the financial company yep so what what made you successful there what, what were the one or two or three things that like got uh, you off the mat the same things is in baseball uh -huh. okay so the massive one everyone asks me they ask you this too what's the one thing you would have somebody have if you were gonna put them in business yeah monster desire and hunger Mm -hmm. Massive desire. You show me somebody with just monster desire, I'll show you somebody who will eventually find the right people. You take that over skill. Big time. You know that. Over IQ. I, 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 I could teach, I, you know, there's tons of people with tons of skills with no heart, no desire, no courage. Yeah, they yeah, lose. Yeah, yeah. You show me a bunch of, I mean, tremendous, like tenacious, relentless, obsessive yeah, heart. Yeah, 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 they'll acquire yeah, the skills yeah. or they'll find the people who have them around them. I heard you were going to write a book about being yeah, obsessed. Yeah, I was in the middle of writing a book about that topic when his came out. It cost me 30 grand with an author and <laughs> it's in the trash can somewhere. And yours was unbelievable, by yeah, the way. Thank you, it's thank one of the, it's a Did awesome me and this book. guy, me and this guy, we, we literally have similar frequencies. We, we do. think about different, we, yeah. we the, this Mandalay Bay shooting that just yeah. happened. Me and Elena were up in Vegas when it, the whole thing happened, but yeah. he was calling me. We have similar thoughts about some things. Yeah. That happened. Okay, yeah. number two thing. Uh, Desire and, and hunger. Okay, and then the norm. This is the basic stuff, but here's the thing. A ferocious, crazy, psycho work ethic. Uh -huh. So they're aggressive, right? Like yeah. you, you, just about you and I, like right now, we're out working guys at our income level. If you took guys at our income, our net worth level, and they're, I don't know if they're similar or different, but they're, yeah, they're yeah. decent, right? That's The fact of the matter is we're out working them. We're out working them when we were broke. We're out working them when we are in the middle. We're out working them when we got to the top. We're out working when we fell down. I outwork people. I get there earlier. I show up uh, sooner. I leave later. I make more phone calls. I dig around less uh -huh. I'm uh -huh. not small talk BS nothing I'm about making money closing people growing my business and I think it's that the third thing is that ability to literally focus in and remove distractions I don't care what's going on in the world I don't believe the world's coming to an end uh -huh. I think what happened when you were in Vegas yesterday is a total tragedy I prayed about it I worried about it but I'm not obsessed about it yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna let the media or the world distract me from my dream get me off track because mm -hmm. in a year we're not gonna be thinking about Las Vegas yeah, you're gonna be yeah. back to your life thinking I don't care what happens in the NFL today, Iraq. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I not, I'm not putting energy into it. No. So it's, you know this, it's how distracted people get. Can you get laser focused on what it is you're, you want, but more importantly, what the hell you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Literally mm -hmm. just show me your habits and what you do. Anybody in, in any sport will tell you that too. The best guys have this massive, massive hunger. They outwork everybody mm -hmm. and they have this ability smaller to get into guys, the, the, Smaller guys. Slower guys. And they get into the hyper focused zone. Beyond just wrestling, this guy ends up, I've watched this by the way, we'll feed in some B-roll as you guys are watching this now. This guy's a weightlifter. 
and a bodybuilder and a really good one. We were talking off camera about our diets and training and the pros and cons of doing that. And it's interesting, but I just keep flashing back. I I keep wanting to say this to you, but it's only when you tell me a story like that or when you make that move that I think about you like, oh, he does have that because your <laughs> spirit's so massive. Thank you. I just don't think about it. And it's, 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 it takes me aback that I don't, frankly, right? Like you're a stud in every sense, man, like Thank a you. massive freaking champion in every sense. Um, by the way, the Lord also wired you with this unbelievable ability to communicate your thoughts in a really passionate, intense, emotional way, which is why he's such a sought after speaker. Because it's one thing to live what you're living and to achieve what you've achieved. It's another thing to be able to articulate it where people can actually picture it and see it emotionally. Like I'm picturing you on that airplane. That's a gift. So God also wired you with the gift to speak. And so if you have an organization, everybody, right? And you want somebody to come in and inspire them and teach them, take their excuses away, give them the tips and strategies that does it. This man has just got the example beyond belief, but also the ability to communicate it. And so before we move into the bodybuilding stuff, we might as well tell them in the middle because you always don't want to wait to the end. Okay. right? So how do they find you? Do they go to your social media? If they do, how do they find you there? And how do they find you to speak? Because I know people watching this are like, okay, I want more of this dude, more than I'm even going to get in the time with my let. How do they find you? So on all my platforms, it's at Nick Santanastasso, my yeah. Instagram. Um, yeah. If you type in Nick No Legs, you know, your boy pops up. <laughs> Is um, that right? Yeah, right. Yeah, Nick yeah, No Legs. So keywords, Ed. Um, Nick but, No Legs. Okay, that's um, good to know. But it's my, for booking, it's booking at booknicksanto.com. Okay. But, you know, that email is linked to my Instagram. And okay. my Instagram's at Nick Santanastasso. Okay. And so they can find me there, but I'm on YouTube and everything. He's everywhere, which, by the way, we might as well do that before bodybuilding. Let me go there first. So one thing you may not know about him, but this dude blew up on Vine, right? And doing, I love that you took your gift, right? Because I actually consider this now your gift. gift. Amazingly, it's your gift and what you've done with it has magnified it, right? And so you've taken that gift and you used it for like humor and pranks and stuff. So a lot of them may not know this, but like also social media is a place where they can be entertained and informed and inspired, which they can through with you. And some of these videos are out there, still YouTube and stuff. So tell them a little bit about what you did. Cause it's like, man, you talk about parlaying something, like taking something, someone might think is a deficient. You go, nope, I'm flipping this into a massive (laughs) strength. Yeah. You did that on Vine with these pranks and stuff. So tell them about that. So when I was a senior, when all that wrestling stuff and, yep. you know, I was gaining that confidence, the app Vine came out and I, had, yep. I was like, oh, I'm going to put myself on the internet, you know? Mm-hmm. And my thing was, okay, if I can motivate and inspire people, that's great. But I also want to make them laugh because yeah. I love making people laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I had a mastermind little like group session with my friends. I'm like, what has never been done before? You know, what has never been done? Because if I post something that's never been done, it's got to go viral. Mm. And I'm like... Guys, how many, is there any legless guys crawling around Walmart pretending to be a zombie? <laughs> no. And they're like, right. hey, exactly. They're right. like, no. I'm like, let's go. Uh, you know? So I, I, I lived in New Jersey. I was in regular clothes and I put fake blood on my face, fake blood, you know, on my clothes. And I said, let's go to Jersey, which that Walmart had been kicked out like three times. They're like, dude, just don't come back anymore. You start too much mm-hmm. trouble. Mm-hmm. And Did they really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been uh, kicked out of that Walmart yeah. for Franken. <laughs> and so we were looking for a victim and there was a, we, we go down the aisle and this guy's looking at paper towels and I'm like, yo, pull out the camera. And so I come around this corner like, Rah! and he throws the paper towels at my face. And I'm like, was it six seconds? And they're like, dude, we got it in six seconds. <laughs> you got him six seconds yeah, on yeah, mine. six seconds. Right. So be creative as you can in six oh seconds. My gosh. And so I'm on my way home, still in school. Yep. And on the way home, I told myself, I said, if this reaches 500 kids, 500 kids and adults, and they could just see, they could see Look how happy Nick is. Yes. You know, look how happy Nick is joking around. Maybe I could be a little bit happier in my situation. That's all mm-hmm. I wanted. God. I woke up the next day, had over 80,000 likes and over 80,000 revines. Damn. And it went internationally viral. Gosh. And you know, news articles from all over the world. But Ed, the one that stood out to me the most, it, the title was NJ Teen, born with disability, turned into a positive. Mm. And that's all I wanted from people. Oh. That's all I wanted people to say, well, look at him making the best of a situation. Mm. Because life hands you one hand. One hand, and you mm. gotta make the best of that hand. You gotta ba- play it to the best of your ability. So mm. I wanted people to show, oh, well, maybe my situation's not that bad, or maybe mm. I could play my hand a little bit better. That's all I wanted for people. Damn. So, you know, that picked up, and I posted a bunch of, now it's just funny. Now it's just posting <laughs> funny videos, some zombie pranks, some other things, mm-hmm. and I gained a million followers in under a year doing that and created this outlet. Jeez. And that led me to Fox International hiring me to scare Norman Reedus, the main actor of The Walking Dead in Tokyo, Japan. Yes. Which, you know, I always tell people the meaning, the, the, the meaning behind all this is when you start to 
focus your energy on serving others and helping others, the universe comes back with amazing opportunities. Yes. Amazing opportunities. Mm. And it's not, that's not some voodoo stuff. Like that's real. Like, yep. you know, the, the energy you put out, it comes back tenfold when you try to help people. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to do is help people. Bro. And so, yeah, I just want to make people laugh. No, but seriously, like you, ch- you, you like fully embraced the, the noise in that to me. Like it's hilarious, it's funny, but you're like, hey dude, it's like you just you say, look, I know you're thinking this about me, I'm gonna make it hilarious, right? And I, I gotta tell you, like, I'm picturing this dude in middle school starting to get pointed at and made fun of, and then he finds himself just a few short years later in Tokyo, Japan, million views, doing something that high profile. It's just freaking unbelievable to me, I right? That. You've also, though, I talked about earlier, I don't want to just tease it because you know I'm an athlete, or I, I, I used to be, or You're I think I am. <laughs> I, think I, th- I still think I'm an athlete. You've turned this thing into now, like, you lift real weights, bro. Thank like, you. I, it's not like cute, like, oh, he lifts weights, isn't that neat? I'm like watching your stuff, I'm like, you have found, it's like, you just won't be stopped. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do bench press. You think I can't do bench press, I'm gonna do it. And you, I'm watching your, I'm like, what the heck? This dude's <laughs> unreal. So you end up going, nah, I don't wanna just like lift weights. Like, uh, I wanna do some bodybuilding. Well, yeah, so. <laughs> from, this is awesome. I, yeah, so I, I was posting the pranks and yeah. I actually moved out to LA. I was supposed to be a core cast member of like an Impractical Joker show yeah. with like a disabled cast so you could pull some pretty cool pranks. Oh gosh, yeah, that would be, that's I moved a great out idea. There, yeah, I moved, I was 18. Good. I moved out there with a roommate, um, just me and my roommate and you know, 18 year old kid, LA is expensive to live in. Yeah. And I was living, it was paying $2,000 a month for a little shack of a, like a loft. Mm. And two weeks after I signed my lease, they canceled the show mm. and I didn't have any income. I went broke. <sighs> I went and I and and you know talk about how my my mom was like as long as you're happy you know we love you my dad was like well you're happy but you need to be independent you need to make money so that was always in my head I was scared I didn't know how to be financially independent I didn't know that I can't work some regular jobs like people oh my god like what am I gonna do mm-hmm. so I'm sitting in LA and I'm broke and I refuse to tell my dad I'm broke I mean I'm eating like peanut butter and tortillas like you know mm-hmm. low low point for yeah, me and yeah. but like I'm grateful for that experience I'm grateful because I live like that I know I know that I can live like that if I ever yeah. went you know Yeah So I moved home I moved home back to my parents in Jersey and I said Nick what's next and mm-hmm. I said That could have been a low well, point Yeah Yeah, yeah but I was like N- you need to stay on what what's next mm-hmm. and my the kid I wrestled one of my best friends Josh that I wrestled with you know we're still best friends to this day he was always a big dude he was always lifting and I thought to myself I said well if I get in super good shape which I don't know how to do it yet but if I get in super good shape I love that do you, if I get in super good shape how marketable is that because you can't buy a fit body they can't take away from me my shape mm-hmm. I put you know put my blood sweat and tears in this they can't mm. it's very marketable too mm. so from a business standpoint too but I did I did want to look good naked you know I wanted to look <laughs> good course, course. and um, and I knew that would that would instill more confidence in me I'd be right. more comfortable in my body because I was out of shape doing pranks mm. so I'm like Josh you know Josh and I had another buddy Ryan that helped me right in the beginning and I said you know this is what I want to do I want to take over the fitness industry because there's no one like me Ooh. I'm a unicorn you know so if you put me in the industry and I excel it's gonna it's it's gonna catch. Yes. So for the first year I posted, you know, these lifting videos, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always tell people, we are the architects of our life. And each and every day we have the ability to learn whatever we want to learn and implement it. You know, mm-hmm. if you don't know it, learn it mm-hmm. and implement it. But mm-hmm. that's the thing, we just, maybe maybe people are just learning things and not taking action, but mm-hmm. you know, you gotta implement it. So mm-hmm. I'm posting these fitness videos for a year and you know, I, I told people, I told all my following from, you know, pranking, yeah. I said, Guys, this doesn't this doesn't make me happy anymore. This doesn't fulfill me. And you know, when I have kids, I want them to know me for much more than crawling around Walmart. So I was like, I want to become a fitness model. I want to become a bodybuilder. I want to become a keynote speaker, and I want to break into the mainstream modeling industry. I put out all my goals. I put out all the things that I wanted to accomplish. I said, these are the things I want to want to accomplish. I don't know how I'm going to do them. You either support me or not. But this is what this is what I want to do. Mm. So for the first year, I was posting these lifting videos with you know my buddies, and I was getting unfollowed. You know, hated on. Dude, we love your pranks. You know why. Why are you oh. doing this? You know, how are you going to become a bodybuilder? You have no legs and one arm. Like, all this stuff. The same cycle. You know, when I wanted yep. to be a wrestler, same cycle. So I was used to it. I was yeah. used to the seen people. This, you've seen this show before. And I was like, yep. I was like, you. I was like, you guys are think, thinking this is a phase for Nick, but this mm. is going to be a lifestyle. I'm going to, mm. I'm going to crush this. So. That's what I tell people. I was going into the gym and it was just trial and error. And that's mm. life, you know, falling on your face and figuring out which approach for you, which approach works for you. Because I couldn't mm. go in the library and say, oh, no legs and one arm, this is how you lift. You know, yes. it wasn't there for me. Yes. So we would go into the gym and figure out, you know, how to work. Well, actually the first six months, I wasn't even working this side. I was like, oh, I don't need this side. You know, I'm just gonna bench press on this side, work okay. this side. Okay. And then I fell in love with bodybuilding. Mm. I fell in love with the way I, it felt, yeah. you know, therapy, you know, the iron, the, yep. this is the therapy. And so I was like, this is something that I really want to do. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do it half assed I want to do 100%. Yeah. So I need, to, I need to figure out this side. So basically it was just like going in there, 
which micro movements can hit this, you know, mm. with the bands or with resistance and how I'm gonna activate that lat, just going in and figuring out different ways. Mm. And my knowledge in nutrition got better, my knowledge in training got better, my physique started to change. change. And people are like, uh-oh, this- it, it changed big time though. What ended up happening? Tell them what happened. I mean, one of the things that happened is you ended up being competitive in shows, right? So, yeah, so I, yeah. I wanted to immer- you know, immersion. I wanted yeah. to basically just get in a better environment. In New yeah. Jersey, there wasn't much of a bodybuilding environment. Okay. So I moved to Tampa about nine months ago. I moved to Tampa nine months ago, and when I moved, I promised myself, I promised my family, my friends, and my supporters, I said, guys, I'm going to step on the stage, the competitive bodybuilding stage for men's physique before 2017 was over. Mm. So not only was that holding me accountable, but that was basically throwing myself in an uncomfortable situation. It forced me, forced me to level up. Damn, and that's dude. what people need to realize is if you don't think you're ready for something, jump into it. You know, yep. like just because it's going to force yourself to learn what you need to learn, learn mm. to excel. Damn. And so embrace the uncomfortable time. So I'm mm. like, Nick, you know, you don't know it, but you'll learn on the way. Right. And so I did a 12 week prep and my, my, my best friend to this day, Cody, Cody and Mitch, Cody trained me, you know, basically dedicated, you know, my whole 12 weeks of the prep to training me. And, you know, I, I gave everything to that prep because yeah. it, I was basically making, making history. Yes. You know, no one stepped on the stage looking like this. So I was like, yep. I was, and, and the thing is, Ed, people would have gave me an, an applaud if I stepped out at 12% mm. body fat. But mm. that wasn't me. No mm. way. Yeah. I'm like, you know, people clap anyway. I'm coming out shredded. Just like, like I'm the giving, wrestling. Same yeah. thing. Don't yeah. clap when I lose. I'm going to yeah. win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, I'm going to come out like the, the best I could possibly be. How you know, shredded gonna, were you? I was, pretty sh- I was pretty shredded. I yeah. was probably like five or six percent. And um, so 12 week prep and actually 10 weeks into my prep, I went out to Mr. Olympia to because I had I had a big I have a big following in fitness, you know, yeah. bodybuilder. People know me all over for bodybuilding. Yeah. So I wanted to go there. And that's a recharge for me for people saying, you know, oh, my God, you motivate me. You know, that's yeah. where I get my fulfillment is, yeah. you know, people telling me how I impacted them. Yes. So I'm going there. I'm recharging. And. You know, we talk about like moments were guided, you know, yeah. moments that were just like, oh my God, this happened for a reason. Yep. The Friday, I didn't, I, I went to the expo. Saturday, I went to the expo. Sunday, you know, I was chilling. I was like, ah, I'm not gonna go to the expo. I'm just gonna hang. I was in a hotel room and I'm like, you guys wanna go to the gym? And they're like, yeah. So we went to City Athletic Club, which is a super famous gym in Las yeah. Vegas. And I remember my boy, Casey Mitchell, he, right when I walked in, he was like, dude, the rock, the rock is upstairs lifting. And I'm like. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, he's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I need to still get a lift in. You know, I'm on prep. Like, yeah. can I still lift? And he's like, yeah. So I go up there, and here, here Dwayne was, you know, with the security guards. Yeah. And prior to that, he, he had retweeted one of my bodybuilding videos on Twitter. So just mm. like, Nick, much respect. Love what you're doing. So I was like, I told my guys, I'm like, he already knows who I am. We don't need to bug him. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be bugged in the gym, you know, if I was him. So yeah. let's just, like, chill. So, like, we're lifting, we're lifting. And he, he was in the corner and he pulled off his headphones and, you know, everybody bombarded with pictures. And, you know, everyone's taking pictures. C.T. Fletcher was there, Kai Green was there, a bunch of studs. Yeah, and then, that's you a know, stud gym. Yeah, that is a stud gym. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm posing in the mirror, you know, I'm like two yeah. weeks out, just like doing me. And his security guard comes up and he's like, can Dwayne meet you? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like, I, I mean, please. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, we'll escort you, escort you so you can privately meet him. And so they put me in a corner, I have it all filmed. And, mm. you know, we, we dabbed me up and he's like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, yeah. I love your stuff. And he's like, I'm a big fan. And I'm like, dude, I'm a big fan of you. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to do what you did. And he's like, what do you, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, dude, you're the rock. People knew you for college football, flag football. And then you went into WWE and then you just took over every industry, bro. Yeah. You're like crushing everything. I said, I'm going to do what you did. And he said, Nick, you're right. Because people like me and you, they put us in any industry and we adapt. We adapt and we overcome. And he's like, I, I you're going to do it. And mm. Talk about a moment of confirmation for me that I was doing mm. the right thing. And mm. after that, he's like, can I grab a picture? And you know, another fangirl moment. I'm like, yeah. dude, of course like, right. you can grab a picture. I love you. Right. So, you know, <laughs> we took you. a picture and yeah. I told him about my competition. You know, he's like, dude, you're shredded. I'm like, I'm two weeks out. That's the only reason right. why I'm shredded. Right. And um, so I told him about my competition and everything, you know, flew home and two weeks later, I'm backstage and I'm pumping up. I'm pumping up for my show and, and Cody comes over and he's like, dude, The Rock just posted you on his Instagram. Come on, man. I'm like, I'm like, really? Yeah. And he wrote this really heartfelt message. It's still there if you scroll down and yeah. you know, very heart, heartwarming message. And at the end he said, Nick, I wanna thank you for you know, sharpening, sculpting my perspective a little bit more on life. And you know, I, and I, and I tell the guys, you know, I, I tell my buddies, when I'm up on stage, it's really hard for me to, it's still hard for me to realize the impact I have on people because it's Nick, just Nick. Yeah. Like, I forget to tell people that I drive a car, but I drive a car, you know, it's yeah. just me doing me. Yeah. So for someone like that to be like, dude, you are moving people. It was yes. just like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm, like I'm going the right way. I'm, I'm going. How'd you do on the show? 
I took, so I, I placed third in men's yeah. physique novice. So it was yeah. my first competition. So that like the amateur, I took third yeah. and I beat an able, I beat some able body guys. And yeah. I was like, yes, yes. you know, like yeah, you crushed. Thank you. How yeah. cool is it by the way? Cause by the way, all of you should know this too. You can someday inspire your own heroes, which is what you did with Dwayne, right? You can someday, your example can inspire your heroes. You said a couple things that I just want to go back to, because we're like, here we go, flying out of time again, right? Because this is like unreal. Number one, several times you said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. So many people are stopped by thinking they need to know how to do something without chasing it. More important is why and your passion for it. The how will reveal itself in the chase. So many people are held back by, I don't know how, right? Get your butt in there, start chasing it, the how begins to get revealed. Also, I think Dwayne used an unbelievable word for you, which is adapt. He said, yeah. guys like you and I adapt. If you think about it, your life, because of the way that you were born, you've had to adapt all of your life. And champions in anything, that yeah, they have drive, yes, they have goals, they have their incantations, they have the gratitude, they have all that. They also have the ability to adapt. It's one of the things not covered on my show, often enough, or any shows that I see like this, is adaptation, adapting to your environment, adapting to conditions, adapting to circumstances that happen to you. And I agree with him. Guys like you, me, and him, and I would just say you specifically, we adapt and we become great at whatever we do. You're about adapting your entire life. And so, stud story, dude. Thank you. Like now you go dominate. Because it's interesting. You did the bowling thing, not real good at that. Wrestling, you got even better. Then you've taken the fitness and the bodybuilding to like a legitimate world class level now, brother. It's like, I want to acknowledge that. I think Thank it's freaking awesome. So, Thank you. we are almost out of time. And I do. I feel like there's something special about you for every audience. I, I, you, you obviously know why you should book Nick to go speak. Let's be real here, okay? You're not gonna have somebody like him ever come into your life, come speak to your organization, your school, or your company, who's literally, I mean, his example's unreal, but his ability to put these words together is unheard of in this Thank space. You. I mean, like, you're gonna come speak to my company. I can tell you that for sure. Thank you. I told you that even before we went on air. Hey guys, when you think about businesses growing beyond their forecast, you could think about something like Feastables by Mr. Beast, right? Or even a legacy business like Mattel. And obviously you think about the product they have to have and branding and the influence and all that other stuff. But what most people don't think about enough is the behind the scenes and the behind the scenes of businesses, you know, things like making things easier for shoppers, buying, et cetera, is really simple. And for millions of businesses, including mine, that business is Shopify. I don't even know what I would do without them when it comes to my books, my gear, basically everything we do goes through Shopify, just like Mr. Beast or Mattel or many of the other big brands that you know. So nobody does it better than Shopify, number one checkout place on the planet, and the not-so-secret Shop Pay, which boosts conversions by 50%. All these things come only with Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Mr. Beast gets with Feastables at Shopify. Sign up for your $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash mylet, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash mylet to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash mylet. Hey everyone, Dave Meyer here to tell you about Laurel Road. Laurel Road is a digital banking platform and brand of KeyBank that provides tailored solutions to support the financial well-being of healthcare and business professionals. In April 2019, Laurel Road became part of KeyBank, which is one of the nation's largest bank-based financial service companies and a member of the FDIC. Laurel Road's banking and lending solutions include student loan refinancing, mortgages, personal loans, student loan cashback credit cards, tailored savings accounts, and more. And right now, for just a limited time, Laurel Road's high yield savings account has an annual percentage yield greater than 4%. That's up to 10 times the national savings rate. And the nice part about this digital account is that it features zero monthly service fees, no minimum balance requirement, and costs zero dollars to open. With perks like that, you'll be seeing results and better buying power for your buck in no time. Visit laurelroad.com slash pockets to learn more and see other ways they can benefit you. Tell them Bigger Pockets sent you. Laurel Road, your partner on the road to financial peace of mind, equal housing lender, member FDIC. These are strategies that are real, that work, that we both do. So there's two prolific entrepreneurs who are now in this space that are saying, these are the things we do. And isn't it ironic that we both do them and we're both addicted to them and we both attribute it to our success. So please talk about that, brother. So um, I have uh, my vision boards and I, I actually have my exceptional life blueprint that I've created. It's about 50 pages of my prayers, my rituals, uh, for my spiritual growth, health, wealth, my money story, my inner mission, my outer mission, wow. um, you know, some of the stuff, you know, either that I 
have or that I'm creating. And so I create these visual representations to trigger the biggest part of my brain called the occipital lobe and to activate my memory center. So I have vision boards for what I want to create. So I'm giving my brain the exact instructions so that not only it focuses helping me achieve that, what most people don't understand about vision boards or creating goals in writing that are specific is that your brain is a deletion and distortion tool as well. Mm -hmm. So if you give your brain the instruction of this is the stuff that's important to me for health, God, spirituality, charity, fun, experiences, my children, my mother, my father, my son, whatever it is, and you say this is what I want to trade my life for, delete and distort everything else, now, all of a sudden, you're using your brain as a deletion and distortion uh, organism in order to be able to help you hyper-focus on what you want. So part one is get absolute clarity on what you want so your brain helps you eliminate what you don't want. Part one. Part two, right? Part two is I tend to be a goal-seeking guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I used to not celebrate the small stuff, and, and I just it's just like you know, fuck, bigger goal, bigger goal, bigger goal, more, bigger, bigger. And somebody says to me, like, are you gonna like slow down just to enjoy some of the stuff that you actually have done for yourself and for people in your family? And I was like, well, uh, let me create an accomplished board. <laughs> so good, so good. Right, so, accomplish board. so accomplish board. You passed that test on your own forty years ago. Celebrate that. You helped this person who was challenged and celebrate that. You know, you did this for him or for her or for yourself. Celebrate that stuff to remind yourself because I'm tough on myself. Like I'm like, I'm let's come on, let's go. It's a goal. Let's go. Um, and sometimes I forget the stuff that I have done, the stuff that I do do that I need to remember. So I created an accomplishments board and a list so I can just go to it when I feel like, holy shit, am I, am I smart enough to achieve that next thing? Am I good enough? What a lot of people don't know, Ed, is so good. when I was a kid, I used to feel like I wasn't smart enough. And when I was a kid, it helped me back. And today I still feel like I'm not smart enough and that fuels me to get smarter. <laughs> so I use it. <laughs> like I said, big goals. I go, God, I don't have the, the skills. I don't have the knowledge, but I can figure it out. I've got contacts. I've got friends and there's books, there's Google, there's, there's YouTube, there's holy mackerel. I don't need to have all the specialized knowledge anymore. So I have a college board, but also, you know, a crap board is what conflicts are, res are, are happening right now. I often say that there's only four things that are holding you back as a human being. Only four. There's not 25. There's four that are the core. One is if your vision and goal is bigger than your self-image. Yes. Okay? So if you don't feel you deserve it, you can have this vision and goal and be excited about it and motivated about it. You will not do what it takes to achieve. One. Two, if you have limiting beliefs. If you have a vision and goal, but you have a limiting belief that you're too young, too old, whatever the case is, your limiting beliefs will drive your behavior. Three, fear. Fear of being embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, or judged. Fear of failure. Fear of disappointment. And we'll talk about disappointment in a moment or fear of succeeding and, and, uh, and failing again. Disappointment. Most, and then the fourth one, by the way, is you're lacking the knowledge and skill required. So that actually sets up a self-doubt trigger, which activates the Frankenstein brain, which causes you to lose motivation. But most people prefer to master disappointment and comfort zones instead of mastering change. Wow. wow. So if I master disappointment, I know what I got. I just have to deal with, well, okay, this, this is what I got. And if I master my comfort zone, then at least this is the devil I know. Yes. Versus mastering change, and we know what's going on in our brain. Under we know what's happening neurologically, biologically, emotionally, physically, and all of that is a skill. It's just a skill. So why not just master change? Why not become an adaptationist right now in the time that you need it the most in the world? Uh, because if you don't, then you're just going to keep repeating the same patterns that are going to get reinforced, and it makes it harder in three months, six months, and six years. So master change now and make that one of your core competencies, and then you master your life. Oh, my gosh. 
You guys, anybody familiar with my work know how much I love this man and how much we line up on these things similarly. I love the way that you phrase things. And guys, one thing about change, one of the reasons we hesitate to change as humans is it's an energy depletion too. Humans kind of want to conserve energy. You have to realize one thing, everybody. Then we're going to go to one more part, and then I'm going to ask you about grief. But yeah, guys, we love to gravitate towards what we're most familiar with. We create these patterns in our life, and we repeat them over and over and over again. And if you're not conscious of what they are, if you don't create new ones, you're just repeating the same life in a different year over and over. And that script that John talked about, your script is the same as it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, with slightly different characters and slightly different uh, dressings in the room. I'm fired up about today's show because we're getting right into what it takes to win. And that is this, write this down, one more, one more. See, I accepted a long time ago, I wasn't the smartest, the best looking, the fast enough, with the best background, the most connections. I didn't have any of those things. What I could control was my work ethic. You've heard me speak many times about outworking everybody, but I think that just feels good when we hear it, but most people don't take it seriously. If you think that I have a little bit of success in my life, I can tell you what I attribute it to. Yes, self-confidence, yes, mindset, visualization, goals, all the things I talk about all the time, listening skills, influence, energy transfer, how to be happier, all of that stuff applies. When you get to winning, for me, it's come down to maxing out. And what maxing out means is you do one more at least than you think you're capable of. So when you're done, whatever you're doing, whether it's at the gym or phone calls or meetings or in sports, one more shot, one more throw, one more swing of the golf club or the baseball bat, the separator is for the winners, they do one more. I'm addicted to one more. And so I want your mantra going forward to be one more. What does that look like if we're working out? That means when we're in the gym and we say, I'm going to do five sets of 10. I'm crazy. Like I'm a psycho because I want to win. I want to be somebody. I want to separate. I want to compete. And the way I do that isn't with my giftedness because I wasn't born with a bunch of gifts. And I think gifts are crap. I think for the most part, gifted people struggle in life because things come easy to them. I like that things haven't come easy for me in my life. I like they don't have natural talents in every area. And maybe you like that about you too. Maybe you've looked at yourself all your life and thought, man, I don't have that natural beauty or that natural talent or this gift for creativity or intellect or humor. I don't have any of those things. But what I got is I will outwork you. And so at the gym, one of the things I focus on, they say it's five sets of 10. When I'm at 10, I go one more, bam, 11. If I'm running on the treadmill and it's a 45 minute run, I never finish at 45. I always go one more minute, 46. If I'm at the office and I'm supposed to make 25 phone calls that day, when I'm at the end of the day, I always do one more. If I've got meetings, I always do one more. My mantra for three decades in business has been one more. Why? because we get out of life what we think we deserve. And I'm the kind of guy that I know when you do 45 minutes on the treadmill and I do 46, I deserve to be fitter. I know that when I'm lifting weights and I watch you do five sets of 10 and every single time I do one more. When it's a set of five, I do six. When it's a set of eight, I do nine. When it's 45 on the treadmill, I do 46. When it's supposed to be 20 phone calls, I make 21. When it's supposed to be an eight hour workday, I work nine. Whatever it is, I always do one more. And what that does is it makes me eventually think I'm doing things other people aren't willing to do, so I should get things other people aren't gonna get. And if you go to the root of the things I believe philosophically about winning, the people that win, the great athletes that I coach, when I watch the really gifted golfer and the one who actually wins, the gifted golfer, they do what they're supposed to do. You never know they weren't working hard. It's not like people don't work hard. Everybody works hard, that's a given now. But what's the separator to where you become the maxed out version of you? See, the gifted golfer, they hit their 100 balls because they're supposed to, but the not so gifted one that ends up winning, they hit 101 or 110 or 120. I watch them on the driving range and you can hear them say, one more, one more. What's the difference between Kobe Bryant and other gifted NBA players when he played or Michael Jordan? 
when they played. Or right now, Kevin Durant, people tell me, or Steph Curry, they're constantly, when everyone else is done shooting in the gym, they say one more. Larry Bird was legendary for one more, one more. The people that would throw the passes to him, the ball guys in practice say, he always wants more, he always wants more. The great hitters that I know, the Mike Trouts and MLB, they're gifted, but they just take a little more. They take that extra batting practice, that extra session. They're always doing extra. That's the separator. Like you can learn all this stuff. You can digest all the tactics information that I give out, but if you're not willing to do one more, eventually there's a part of you that says, maybe, maybe I don't deserve it. I'm just doing what everybody else is doing, and that's not good enough. It's not even good enough to do more than everybody else. It's your maxed out level. It's one more of everything. And so whether that's a phone call, an email, a text, an appointment, one more time you tell your spouse you love them, one more time you go in and kiss your children goodnight, one more hug of somebody, one more phone call, one more everything. I want your theme to be one more. Have I said that enough times for you today? So what's that really look like in application? Well, the second thing it does for you is you actually do more reps of whatever it is you're doing. And when we do more repetitions, we get better. And when we do more repetitions, we're more productive. So number one is the psychology part. If you're someone who's always doing things other people aren't willing to do, you always max out, you always go to the next level, you convince yourself you deserve to win. You can take low self-esteem, low identity, low confidence, and change it over time by building this habitual addiction to doing one more, this obsession of one more. All the greats do one more and all the average don't. It's not that the average don't work hard. It's not that the average at your company, they don't, it's not that they don't work hard, they probably work pretty hard, but do they always do extra? Do they always do one more? Do they always do 10 more if they need to? Do they always get after it? The other part of it, number two, is you just get better because of the reps. You're just doing more of something, you get better. You get, you get stronger. You, you become a better phone caller when you make one more phone call every day. You become a better communicator when you do one more meeting every single day. You get better at coordination in your sport or at the gym by just doing more reps. Yes, you get better, so that's the second layer. But the third one is you stack the odds in your favor. See, for me, I want the odds that I'm going to win to increase. The larger numbers we play in life in every area, more is always better. People tell you, more isn't always better. And almost everything, more is better just so you know, and almost everything. People who tell you more isn't better in most things are lazy, and they try to justify their own weakness. Don't let people who are justifying their own weakness convince you that you working hard, you doing more, isn't the pathway to your success. People say, well, you gotta work smarter, not harder. That's a lie, because everybody who wins works smarter. The separator is who works harder, and by the way, we become smarter through working harder. All the new revelations, all the breakthroughs, all the new discoveries always come when you're doing one more. Always come through more repetitions. You find new ways, new strategies, new words, new keys by higher repetitions. So even if you believe working smarter is more important, you will become smarter by doing more. So if you work 300 days a year, let's just say, 300 days a year, that's 300 more phone calls every single year, over five years, that's 1,500 more contacts. 1,500 more contacts. Just think about that just for a second. Over 30 years, that's 9,000 more contacts. What are the odds the person who makes 9,000 more contacts or even 300 more a year are gonna win? You give me two average people that walk in a room, same ability, same skills, same backgrounds, same product. One of them makes 300 more contacts a year than the other one, who's gonna win? We know. How about over five years? One of them makes 1,500 more contacts over five years. Who's gonna win? Over a lifetime, 30 years of work, one makes 9,000 more contacts. Who's gonna win? You stack the odds in your favor. Never mind the person who made the 9,000 more contacts is better. They've got more reps, they've got more confidence, they believe they deserve to win. They just have 9,000 more opportunities. How about a golfer? One of them makes 300 more swings a year. A year, and that's just one more swing a day. Right, and over a year, over five years, 1,500 more, 9,000 over a lifetime. Who's more likely to win? So you pick anything you want, you begin to stack the odds in your favor. How about at the gym? If every day you went one more minute in your cardio, so it's supposed to be 45, you do 46. Do you know what that starts to do to you? You start knowing you're different. 
You start knowing you obliterate standards. You start knowing you can break through. When you break through an artificial barrier, like 45 minutes, you do one more. It sets a catalyst for your entire day. It sets a syntax. It sets a mindset for the rest of your life. Never mind the fact that if you do 300 more minutes, which is 9,000 more over your lifetime, who's gonna be more fit? So you begin to stack these things and your entire life changes. This is what I like to call compound pounding. Most people underestimate what time can do when backed up with massive activity. Right as I'm speaking to you, I'm looking out at the ocean right now and there's a massive rock formation and you can see the rivets and the rocks. And what caused those rivets and the rocks was compound pounding of the ocean hitting that rock over and over and over again over and over, compound pounding against that rock. And over time, that ocean breaks the rock down over time, where you can see the breakdown in a rock that water does hitting it. Think about that over time. Not one time when the water hits it, not two times, not five times. When you add up years and years and years of that water hitting the rock, it breaks it down. And that's like getting through to your dream. You have to be like that water hitting the rock I'm staring at right now that over time, that compound pounding breaks down the barriers, breaks down the obstacles, breaks down anything in your way of getting to your dream. So I'm sold out on all the strategies and tactics that I teach you. But what I believe in completely is the power of compound pounding. And here's the crazy thing about most people. They will give up on their dream before the compounding has been allowed to kick in. So they'll work at it and they'll work at it and they'll work at it and they don't see the breakthrough. But what they don't understand is that rock was getting ready to break if you just keep pounding against it. But because most people don't see the evidence, see, if you watch that water hit that rock over one day, you're gonna see no difference. Two days, no difference. Five days, no difference. Maybe even a year, there's no difference. Maybe even five years. But you have the compound pounding of every wave hitting that rock over and over again. There's an inevitability to the breakdown of the rock. That's true of your goals and dreams as well. There's an inevitability to success. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, when we adopt one more, when we adopt compound pounding. Do you know the kind of confidence you begin to have when you just accept in your life that I am going to be relentless, I'm always gonna do extra, and you accept the fact that all things break down over time. All the barriers will go away, all the obstacles will go away, everything in your way will go away if you keep after it over an extended period of time. Most people overestimate what they can do in a year. They do. They set up goals for a year and they overestimate where they're going to get to. And they dramatically underestimate what they can do in a decade. And the reason for that is most people don't understand the power of compound pounding. So I want you to accept today that you're going to be relentless, that you're going to keep coming, that you're like a dripping faucet. You're like those waves hitting the rock. Other people are gonna get slowed down. Other people are gonna take a break. Other people are gonna flinch. Other people are gonna cool it. Other people are gonna believe they've made it. Or maybe some people are gonna believe they can't make it. But you're gonna be relentless. You're gonna be repetitious. You may not be the fastest. You may not be the smartest. You may not be the strongest. You may not be the most beautiful. You may not have the most articulate thoughts and ideas in the world. But what you got is compound pounding. What you got is one more. And when they get weak, you just keep company. When they flinch, you blow their doors off. That's how you win in life, is you keep getting after it and keep getting after it until the job gets done. You show me somebody who can succeed, so a lot of people can be excited for a day. They can be excited for a month. Some people can be excited for a year or two or three years. But the winners, they stay excited as long as it takes to get the job done. They keep after it until the job gets done. They never stop, they're always after it. And that's where their strength comes from. That's where their confidence comes from is knowing their capacity to keep coming at you and that all your competition's gonna get weak, they're gonna get tired, they're gonna surrender, they're gonna give in, they're gonna think they made it, they're gonna take a break, they're gonna cool it, and you just keep coming. It's just nature, just like the nature of the ocean against that rock, it's just nature that you run down your dream, that you knock down your dream. I want you to implement all the things that I teach on Max Out, all the tactics, all the strategies, but more than anything, I want you to buy into the fact of an inevitability of you winning, that it's inevitable, that it might not be a year or two years or three years, but you're gonna stay excited and you're gonna keep doing one more until the job gets done. Today's message is very simple. You 
can win. You should win and you will win. I want you to feel this. You will win if you just keep coming. You keep getting after it. You keep doing one more. You can control this. You can't control all the exterior things in your life. People's attitudes, how they treat you, who cancels on you, who changes their mind, who hates on you, who lets you down. But you can control this. You can always go 46 instead of 45. You can always go 11 instead of 10. You can always make the next phone call. Always do one more meeting. Always do one more. Always, always, always. And I promise you, you will knock down that rock that's in between you and your dream and make them come true. Today's really simple. You're gonna knock down whatever that rock is that's been between you and your dream. You're gonna keep after it. You're gonna be relentless. You're not gonna give in. You're gonna be the person who stays excited until the entire job gets done, until that dream is real. And you know long term, all these other people, they're gonna flinch, they're gonna get weak, and you won't. You've adopted a max out mindset. And I wanna remind you today to stay connected with me. I want you to win. Hope you can feel it today. I wanna break it down to its most simple, form, which is that you use nature to your advantage. You use the force of you, the force of effort, the force of sustained effort over an extended period of time to wear out the obstacles in front of you and your dream. I want you to feel the confidence that comes with that. I'm telling you, look at me, listen to me. You're going to do this. You're going to win if, and it's a big if, if you'll just adopt it. It ought to be written everywhere. One more, one more, max out everywhere you can put it. It's inevitable. It's not if anymore. It's just when. And I want to remind you of that. And another reminder is the max out two minute drill. I'm trying to stay so connected with you. I want to know what you're going through. I want to know what your issues are, your thoughts, your, your hopes, your aspirations, your dreams, so that I can help you with the right material, the right tactics, the right inspiration. So every day on Instagram, we run the max out two minute drill. And it's very simple. Here's what winners get, by the way. The winners of the max out two minute drill win coaching calls with me, with my guests, tickets to see me speak, copies of my book, max out gear. There's some going forward now in a few weeks that are riding on my jet with me, doing their coaching call live on my jet. There's so many great things that you can win, and there's three ways to win that prize. When I make a post in my main feed on Instagram, you just make a comment within the first two minutes, and not just hashtag max out. Make a comment in the first two minutes. We pick a winner every day who just makes a comment in the first two minutes, and we usually extend it to about five minutes. Number two, Make a comment on other people's comments. So after you've left your comment, comment on a few other people's comments. I'm gonna to begin to reward people who connect and collaborate because I want you doing that with each other in the community. So make a comment on someone else's comment. And third, if you miss the first two to five minutes, that's not a problem. Just make a comment every day on every post I make. And at the end of the week, we pick winners who just make a comment every day, regardless of whether it's at two minutes or four hours or eight hours afterwards. Doesn't matter what time it is. So there's three ways to win. I wanna encourage you to participate in the max out two minute drill share and subscribe to today's program i hope it gave you hope i hope it gave you certainty and I hope it gives you a very simple recipe to dominate speaking of life and needle moving i don't know if you texted me this or you posted it so it probably doesn't matter but that's the micro stuff the macro is you're so obsessed with this that you look at like duration of time on the planet Mm -hmm. And it was something about you just realized you read something on your you're laughing, but you, did you text me this or did you post it? I just posted that I wanted to live one million hours. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you read something that convinced you that you're going to that you could live to a particular age and you deduced how many hours there. So I actually think this is brilliant because yep. this type of focus causes us to live with intention and attention and the lack of I think all the time. Do you know when I pray at night you're going to laugh at this? Never said this out loud, not even to my wife. I'm going to tell you and about 70 billion people right now. When I pray at night, one of my last prayers is that I'm going to live to 128 years old. Mm, mm. Okay. And I really believe now, again, someone will listen to this in three years. Wow. It's so sad. He passed away. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I have that prayer and that intention and I've repeated it over and over and over and over again. Because I believe if I don't pick a number, if I don't pick a time, if I don't set a goal, if I don't, then it'll, I'll be up to the whims of whatever else comes my way. And I really believe that you create a space when you set something like that that didn't exist before you did it. And then you find the behaviors, the people, the things, the thoughts, the technology, the nutrition to fill it up. What I didn't do was calculate the amount of hours that it gives me yep. to then optimize that time. So speak to that whole thing. Yeah. And, and look, I'm 
you know, it makes it really makes me happy. That means we're gonna we're literally we're gonna be friends deep into our hundreds. I love it. We're gonna be having these conversations about well, yeah. what do you think? You thinking you're going to one twenty eight? You think you're gonna? I don't know. I'm push. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Um, but awesome. I think about it more from a. This is what I'm big on. This is your existence. Right. And, and this is this is the framework of the, the experience, the human experience. Right. You only truly can judge anything, your energy, how well you're using time, how, everything that's happened in your past, how you actually feel in the present moment. You can only do it in the present moment and you only experience it in your mind, Mm -hmm. right? And then you have to make a decision of like, I want to change um, all of these things. So I'm going to create a better future experience. That is the human experience. And I realized that it, that I wanted to make it last to 112. I initially wanted to live to 104 Mm -hmm. and be shot in a rocket into space and explore the universe without the um, light pollution from planet Earth for the last year before I died and then floated out into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Now, that was before I had a wife and kids. And so it's like now the audacity of don't worry about me. And then like I'm up there for like 24 more years. Like, oh. <laughs> you know, so uh, that changed. And then when I read the book Ikigai, right, the Japanese long life and happiness book, um, they talked about super centurions. And I'm like, oh. Like that. like that brand. I want to be a super centurion. So then I made it at, um, then I made it. Uh, that I would want to live to 112. And then as I started getting deeper into, okay, how many days is that? All right. Okay. That's how many days I have. This is how many days that I've done so far. Then when I was going, going through my time matrix and looking at all these different things where I spend time of like, wow, I spend nearly as much time shooting a television show as I will picking up my kids and taking them to school for the year. Right. And, and to me, as I just started looking at these hours and then where am I, where am I losing a lot of time? Mm-hmm. on the couch watching Netflix mm-hmm. you know what I mean it's mm-hmm. it's me and the wife on there mm-hmm. watching our favorite show but boy when you start looking at what that is man <laughs> you're letting you're letting the hard eight to nine percent go, go on the couch you know what I mean like it's it's cold hard reality but as I looked at that you know I'm I then was like you know what is like what's a round number of time and like wow one million hours is 114 years and 54 days yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna experience a million hours on this earth right and so of course a lot of people push back on like oh it's good yeah you're like a vegetable what are you gonna do and, and it's like like i didn't even contemplate that and yeah. and it's because you live in two different mindsets. There's, I live in a mindset that I just keep getting healthier and happier, mm-hmm. more balanced, lighter. Life is more effortless. My system, that is my entire body is more efficient. And I can show you in blood work. Mm-hmm. I can show you in net worth. I can show you in time. And I can show you in qualitative data that I have collected about how I feel about my life, work, and health that I am uh, in healthier, better physical condition, wealthier, more balanced, and happier in the data, which only proves to me there's no reason why you can't keep getting healthier, happier, and wealthier for the for the remainder of your life. That's and then That's I'll just meh, fall right off a cliff. Right you, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever it ends up ending. But again, what's it go back to? I want to live with, with absolute intention. And I want to experience every moment that I get into and feel the vividness and the richness and the beauty that is the human experience and life. Mm. You know, you don't want to be so future focused and trying to create a better future that you never feel the present oh right God. and so for me i'm i really began to un- understand what state my mind is at all the time at all times and how do i learn to control that and begin to put in systems and solutions that keep my mind in a balanced state is really one of the bigger things that i've learned to do over the last year or so share you know that's I mean? one of those systems Which well you know I, I, the, the if you can imagine this your your mind is is balanced in this way right you it's past present and future okay. right and so there's sort of five sections as i see it and, and on one end it's dwelling in the past 
okay. you ain't doing nothing. You want to sit and dwell about something you did? You ain't doing nothing. Then the next level up is rectify, right? You are problem solving, taking action, something that happened in the past. So now you're in the present past where, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with something that happened. Now I'm problem solving, taking action to make a better future, right? You sit right in the middle and you experience it or you go to the next level is creating, Right. Mm -hmm. And so now you're in this future present, mm -hmm. right, where you're experiencing the present while creating the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's where you want to toggle. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what goes beyond creating the future is wishing. Hmm. Right. Because then if you're sitting there wishing the future was better and wishing like like this will be like this or you're dwelling, you're not moving, mm. right? And so you want to be either experiencing the moment mm. or handling something that happened in the past present or creating something in the future present state oh. and, and, and swing between that, right? And so if you can imagine that's your mind, what you, what you think about on an ongoing basis is ranges between all of that. That's where the action lives. Now it's the quality of your mind and your mind's quality is either in a, a proactive state a reactive state, an inactive state, or a magnetic state, right? And for me, when I when all aspects of my life are in order, meaning I'm eating super clean, everything, all all my goals and visions and everything is is running smooth. I'm I'm spending very little time rectifying the past because I've designed my present future experience with such intention. I'm dealing with very little disruption that then I eventually go beyond just being proactive to this magnetic state. And I know you've experienced this before because this is when your everything is going at, operating at such a level that answers start coming to you without you asking the questions. It is the law of attraction that that's the unexplainable force that lives in the quantum field where your energy is at such a high level. You are so clear of not only being present and experiencing, but creating your better future and you rise to this, you vibrate to this level to where the answers show up and you never ask the questions, right? And for for me, I am trying to master all aspects of my existence to where I basically sit in that state of toggling mm -hmm. between future present and proactive and magnetic at all times. Oh, my God. It's a deep one. It's a deep oh, one. No. <laughs> okay, that's an all-timer right yeah, there. That's a deep one. I, I want everyone to go back the last five or six minutes there. That's an all-timer. Um. When we talk, I always filter it through my life and my perspective. I just realized something because I do know what that vibrational frequency feels like. When I am getting answers to questions I haven't even asked, it's not frequent enough. And the, and the reason it's not frequent enough is I'm depleting my energy reserves to not put myself in a state where I can have that type of energy and what I call vibrate at that frequency. Yep. And you're exactly right. And that's the other reason why rest, recovery, being present matters. I just really pulled something here. This, yeah, I just and, really did. But let me say this. Every single thing matters. Every thought, every action, every decision, every single thing that you do is interconnected to to get you to that space. And, mm -hmm. and for me, it's like, I think, oh, I'll have a glass of wine. I'll have a couple of chips. Mm -hmm. It 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 will pull it will pull away from that. I'll make it I'll make one bad decision from eating bad mm -hmm. that will then cause me to be short with my wife that leads to this entire and pull, pulls me right out of the magnetic state. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's like even when you're there it's really sensitive and you could just get one thought that could rip you out of that. You could look at one text that could rip you out of that, right? It's mm -hmm. like and so that requires really, really understanding every single bit of you and then giving value to everything you do rather Jeez. than trying to like pocket your values. Oh, if I eat healthy. Oh, if I stay focused. Oh, if I clear out this stuff. Oh, if I rest or recover it versus like, no, it is all works together to make the best version of you. Mm -hmm. How committed are you? How disciplined are you to live at, at the level that you know you have to live at? at a consistent enough basis that it becomes to compound effortlessly and become a way of life rather than getting disciplined again. Hmm. That's really what it is, you know. Well, for me, I burn myself out going from those states to the good state back to the bad state. I'm still having wine with you at dinner tonight, but um, 
I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, I, everybody, you know, you all hear the show every single week. It's pretty rare that I'm this quiet because I just, I, my, really process a lot of information when you and I go like this. Yeah. It's good for me. I'm already thinking of stuff I'm going to say and I'm going to teach that I'm going to steal that I'm going to make mine. <laughs> your actions also have to line up. You're I, never going to be able to think your way to success. I love Think and Grow Rich. It's my favorite book other than my scriptures, but I got to be honest with you. You don't just think and get rich. You got to do stuff. The question then becomes, what do I need to think and what do I need to do simultaneously or in congruency mm. that produce the result? And that's why I did the things that I had the things in the book. Second chapter, as you know, and I know you're a huge Matrix fan. I like I, as I'm writing this chapter, this is Tom's chapter. I was like, this you is know. the greatest chapter ever written. <laughs> I love this. But one of the points that I make in the book is be able to slow things down and get into bullet time. But there's two things I love about the matrix one I think that's an absolute example of the reticular activating system in the brain and so you do have to be good but the question in life becomes listen I believe your one decision one relationship one meeting one one show one thought one new emotion potentially away from changing your entire life mm -hmm. I've proven this in my life so have you and the question then becomes how do you find them and this RAS is super powerful in our brains because it's the mechanism that filters the entire world to us. It literally reveals to us our reality, just like you just said. It reveals our reality. I just bought a Tesla. I drove it here today. I like what Musk is doing. I'm like, I'm gonna get one of these Teslas. Man, every freaking where I go, I see Teslas now. Mm. Red one, babe. Hey, there's a white one. There's a plaid. Three lanes over, other side of the freeway. Babe, black Tesla just drove by. She's like, how in the world do you know this? Because it's become important to me. Mm. And it's now in my filter. It's now a part of my RAS. That's why when you're in a loud room, all the auditory sounds, someone doesn't even say it loud. Tom, you can hear your own name in a room because it's become important to you. See, the question in life is, can you make your goals, your ambitions, the emotions you want, the thoughts, the relationships you need to become your Teslas? Right. And if they become your Teslas, things slow down. The other part of the matrix I love, I'll come up for air, is Neo is the one. He's the one. And when my wife and I were little, I literally live on the beach now, brother that we used to walk on. Mm -hmm. We were in high school, we were dating, and we'd walk on this beach and go, babe, I'm gonna get you one of these beach houses. We're gonna, we're gonna get one of these beach houses. She goes, you are? I go, yep. And I'd have no idea how, and I go home, I go, dad, who are these freaking people? Who lives there? He's like, I don't know who the heck they are, but they don't work with me, you know? And I figured something out. When you find a family or a person that's happy and successful, or either one, somewhere back in their lineage, they weren't. Mm -hmm. That family wasn't. And then the one shows up, the one. And that one changes that family forever. It changes the way they live, the way the world treats them, the way they think. They're the Neo, they're the one in their family. And in my family, I'm the one, I'm the one. I didn't like it, I didn't hope for it, I fought for it. I fought for it, I did the things in this book to become the one in my family. And if you're listening to this or watching it, why don't you consider the fact that potentially maybe you're the one? And the fact that you don't think you are or that you're not qualified to be the one, or don't have the background or the skills or the confidence, probably makes you the one, because mm. that was me. Now what, what does the one do? What do they introduce to the family that changes it so profoundly? I think they introduce a different way of thinking, Tom. I think they introduce a belief system that the world doesn't dictate the terms to our family anymore. We're gonna dictate the terms to the world. And that we have some measure of control over the results of our lives. I think most people go through their lives thinking they have no measure of control. And I had a huge breakthrough, brother, two weeks ago. After I wrote the book, and as you know, as I, I wrote the book, when my dad died, I thought, I need to write this book because my dad taught me all these profound lessons of one more, and I'm the next to go. I don't know if it's this week or 60 years from now, but I'm the next to go. And I woke up about three o'clock in the morning, 3.15 exactly, and I woke up, Christian, I said, babe, wake up, and I was in tears. This was just two weeks ago. I said, babe, someone helped daddy. Now, I'm 51, bro. My dad was sober for 35 years. This never occurred to me. She goes, what? I said, someone helped my dad. She goes, what do you mean? Someone helped my dad in his darkest moment of his life get sober in some coffee shop or quiet place when my dad was down on his knees, losing his family, some precious human being helped my dad. Mm. I don't know who they are. They changed our entire family. Max and Bella's lives are changed because this person that we don't know, millions of people I've reached because this person helped my dad. She goes, that's amazing. I said, here's what's more amazing. What qualified them to help my dad? Mm. Their shame, their mess, 
that they were also a drug addict and alcoholic. This precious soul, the things they're the most ashamed of, that they think disqualified them the most in life, is the very thing that qualified them to help my dad in the most important moment of his life, is where their giftedness, their experience, their shame, their setbacks, is what qualified them to change my life and my dad's life in this dark space. I've been in personal development. My dad's been sober forever. It never occurred to me. The mess you have in your life, the things you are most ashamed of and embarrassed by that you think are the most insignificant, that disqualify you the most, are probably the very things that will qualify you to connect with another human being in your business or your personal life to change their life. And don't ever underestimate the ripple effect. They were just helping some man get sober in some dark space in his life, never knowing the one was his son. Never knowing that this whole existence of my family was changed, not just by me being the one, not just by my dad's decision, but by a completely flawed person. Mm. Remember, this, think about this person. At some point, maybe they were stealing from their family, driving drunk, did things they're completely ashamed of in those states. That was the experience that qualified them to change my dad's life. So if you're listening to this or watching it, stop discounting yourself. Stop carrying these bags of your life of the things you're embarrassed or ashamed of or that you think are insignificant, that don't amount to anything. Those are the things, you, precious you, that could change another precious human being's life in a moment where they need you the most. And if you don't believe you're qualified, if you don't believe you can do it, you're gonna miss those moments in your life. And your entire existence here wasn't what it was supposed to be. The scripture says, hey, where there's no vision, the people will perish. If you dig deeper at that, it's not that people don't have any vision. Look, would you rather be fit or fat? Would you rather be happy or sad? Would you rather be rich or poor, right? Like, would you rather have a private jet or fly commercial? This is, these are easy questions. People have a vision. Their issue is depth perception. Right. They think they're further away than they are. Yeah. And because they think they're so far away and it's so complicated, everything stays that far away all their life. They keep it there by their behaviors. But what if the truth is, you're one decision away from changing your life. You're one relationship. You're, like I said earlier, you're one podcast. You're one YouTube video. You're one new book. You're one new meeting. Check this out. About three weeks ago, I'm playing golf. And a really good friend of mine goes, I want you to meet this guy. I want you to play golf with him. Your net worths are similar. And he's a fascinating dude. And there's, you know, meet guys every single day worth hundreds of millions of bucks. Let's get together. I go, all right, I'll play with him tomorrow. So I go to the first tee. And he goes, oh, Ed Milet, I'm a huge fan of yours. I can't wait to spend five hours. I got all these questions for you. I go, that ain't how it's going to work, bro. I already know about me. I want to know about you. Yeah. Tell me your story. And he goes, I can do it on the first tee. It's really simple. I go, give it to me. He goes, 1986, I loaned a dude 50 grand. So did my best friend. This is fascinating, bro. And he goes, a week later, my best friend said, got scared, said, give me the 50 grand back. I kept the loan to the guy. He goes, it turned into 750 million bucks. <laughs> I said, get the heck out of here, dude. Who'd you loan that money to? Jeff Bezos. Shit. <laughs> oh, you gotta be kidding me. That dude was one relationship, one decision, one loan away from completely changing his life. Now that's an exaggerated example. I don't have that story, but I have a series of little, as you've said, one more decision, yes. one more meeting, one more breakthrough, one new emotion, one new thought, and every single time I've changed my life. He did it in one big one. Yeah. But you're right, you're way closer to the change than you think you are, and oftentimes it's a very simple change.